Good evening. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm waiting for the online audience to say good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Karen Taylor. I'm program director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. I am delighted to welcome tonight both our in-person audience and our online audience to our full labor lit literature and landmark lecture series. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And I would like to express our appreciation to them for their assistance. And I would also like to thank uh, Douglas Curran and Pam Summers of Rizzoli for their help. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded in 1785, 237 years ago. Today, our organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of the City of New York through our various cultural and educational programs. These include um, our General Society Library, of course, of which you are sitting in at the moment, which recently celebrated 200 years. Our John M. Mossman Lock Museum, for the in-person audience, you can see that upstairs and you're welcome to visit after the talk tonight. And our Mechanics Institute, um, our tuition-free Mechanics Institute. And finally, of course, our lecture series. Our lectures series has a very distinguished history. It was started in 1837. It is such a great pleasure to introduce to you our two guests tonight, Andrew Garn and Eric P. Nash, who will have a conversation about their fabulous new book, New York Art Deco. And at this moment, I should have a copy of New York Art Deco so I can show you how absolutely gorgeous it is. And I think that I may have it in one second, but it's, abs it's absolutely splendid. It's on its way. So you've, uh, for our in-person audience, uh, you've probably had a chance to already have a look at it. Uh, for our online audience, it is the most gorgeous book. And I'm so pleased that the, both the editor and designer are here this evening. It is a wonderful book. Um, as, and as I've just inferred, this wonderful book will also be available for purchase this evening, courtesy of Genesee, uh, Jenny at Books on Call. Andrew Garn is a Fulbright winning photographer and author of New York by Neighborhood as well as Bethlehem Steel, Exit to Tomorrow, World's Fair, 1933 to 1970, Subway Style, The New York Pigeon, Wildflowers of New York City. Eric P. Nash is the author of Soho, New York, as well as Manhattan Skyscrapers, now in its third edition, Sky High, a critique of NYC's super tall towers from top to bottom, and, oh, this is actually due out from Princeton Architectural Press in June. In addition, um, um, uh, Eric is also the researcher for uh, the New York Times, for, was a researcher for the New York Times for 25 years, where he wrote more than 100 articles. It's such a tremendous pleasure to introduce to you both Eric Garn and Eric Nash. Thank you. Oh, or even Andrew Garn and Eric Nash. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna, so we're going to try something new tonight. We're going to talk simultaneously for 45 minutes. And if you can get information from it, great. If you can't, that's how it goes. Anyway, I just want to... Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. We have a microphone. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out live tonight which is pretty amazing. It's been quite a while. Le Zoom lectures get kind of old. And I wanted to thank uh, Karen Taylor from the General Society, uh, Douglas Curran, the uh, editor, I think he is from Rizzoli, and the designer Aldo Sempieri, I believe, and also the great 
architects and designers who made all the beautiful things that we got to photograph for the book. Or something? No. Okay. So I just have a quick question before we get into it. Um, who here really thinks they know what is Art Deco? One person. Two people. <laughs> really? Wow. You're very bold to put up your hand. Okay. So we, we have just a preamble here. So Art Deco refers to a design style that was in everything, perfume bottles to radios, automobiles, locomotives, watches, skyscrapers, almost every facet of life bore the stamp of Art Deco from the 1920s to 40s. And we'll actually make the point that Art Deco never actually died. However, the term Art Deco was never used in its heyday. Designers simply referred to their work as modern or modernistic. The root of the style is, of course, often attributed to the highly inf influential World's Fair, Le Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs, a inter uh, industrial modern in Paris. So we're going to look at a few examples. And of course, one thing to mention, if that Paris exhibit was the headwater of style, its expression is very open to interpretation, as we'll see. There is there's a lot of hybridization and combining of styles from Adamesque neoclassical to Viennese secessionism to Babylonian and Egyptian revival. Deco designers raided the vaults of historic styles as freely as their eclectic Victorian predecessors. In tonight's presentation, which is based on our new book, we will see examples of a wide range of Deco styles characterized by brilliant color, planner, oh, sorry, plain flatness and symmetry. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, and okay, and we'll mention one thing. Okay, so these are, this is what Art Deco could be. And it was obviously in every part of life. So automobiles, radios, locomotives. These are by some of the most famous designers of the time, Raymond Lowy, Henry Dreyfus, and even motorcycles. And they represent speed and the future. Okay, Art Deco in New York is forever associated with the fizzy energy of the jazz age. Flappers, speakeasies, the gleaming tiara of the Chrysler building, everything that was new and swellant about the second decade of the 20th century. But its stylistic roots go much deeper. One critic noted that Deco's influences range from the ancient past to the distant future. Deco is easy to recognize, but is difficult to pin down as a blob of mercury. So we're gonna to start tonight's presentation from the book with someone that we decided sort of anticipated Deco, and this is Henry Lee Meter. We don't hear too much about him. Yeah, sorry, I'll speak into this. Yeah, we only have one mic, so. So we, we look at Henry Lee Meter's work, which is all throughout the city as sort of pre-imagining Deco. He is combining very unusual motifs, Mayan, Navajo, Aztec in these designs. This is the cliff dwelling, and this is 1914, which of course predates Deco, but it looks Deco. This is his building on West 14th Street. And although it's neoclassical, it has a lot of Art Deco influences in, it, in the coloration of the tiles. Some of the things you want to talk about. Yeah, what's really important here is the polychromy, the color, the light blue, the mustard, the green. This is something we haven't seen before. Uh, neoclassical design was often two colored. If you look at uh, Robert Adam, there's a blue and a white, much like Wedgwood. But here we're branching out into greens and blues. It's sort of like uh, coming alive from an old tradition. Right, and let's not forget, this is 1913, way before anybody made Deco, when the first Deco buildings in the city. So this is an early example, 1925. This is uh, called the Madison Belmont building. It's on 34th Street in Madison. The lower four stories are all by Edgar Brandt, who is a French 
metal smith, I guess, metal designer. And the upper stories were designed by Warren and Wetmore who did Grand Central Station. Here we see these incredible motifs that are sort of a, 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 a sort of melding of nature, but also gears of a car. If you see that, it, they're not just flower petals. They're really something very, very different. And just as an anecdote, uh, Brandt did all this work from his studio in Paris on commission. He only came to the United States once and he came over on La Normandie, which was a great deco liner for which he had actually designed the flatware, the tableware. And he didn't stop and visit this site. He went directly to Washington. This was wartime in France, remember. And what he was proudest of was designing artillery shells for the US military. So, so this building is considered by many to be the very first Art Deco skyscraper in New York. If you don't know it, it's called the New York Telephone Building, also known as 140 West Street, also known as the Barclay Vesey Building. This is by Ralph Walker. And the, the, it's actually right across the street from the World Trade Center. And it's just filled, at, it's just a riot of details of animals. We see elephants and flowers and birds everywhere. I mean, you see, you just see it everywhere. It's crazy. And he was one of the first people to use precast stone molds, which saved money. And if it needed to be repaired, he, he thought to the future, they could easily reuse the molds. And in fact, this building faces the World Trade Center. And although the World Trade Center totally collapsed, this building was pretty much intact. They did have to replace a few parts. So he was very smart to look to the future that way. And just as a note, this single building made uh, Ralph Walker's career. He, su he succeeded from his firm, founded his own wildly successful firm, and was anointed architect of the century in 1957 by the New York Times. But it might have been a little premature because five years before that, Gordon Bunshaft, the genius behind Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, designed the first all glass building uh, lever house in 1952 on Park Avenue. And that building made the masonry uh, curtain obsolete. It was all glass after mm -hmm. that. Yeah, this looks old fashioned compared to glass <laughs> skyscrapers. Um, so this is the lobby, which goes a block long from West Street to Vesey Street, and it's pretty incredible. So the ceiling it are six different murals depicting communications in different ages, starting with smoke signals from Native American Indians. And, and ending up here with something extremely modern, we see the woman holding, we see her holding up the cables and these are all, this is all telephone cables. And you see there's telephone lines here. There's the, oh, sorry. There's the old uh, candle stick phone right here. Um, but then mixed in with the whole thing, there's tons of vines and there's amaranth leaves here. These are the elevator cabs which with birds. So in a way it was to soften, I think a lot of the machine age. And you see the chandelier with it, it has roots of a tree. It's pretty spectacular. Yes, and one way that Deco kind of softened the edge of the machine age was to employ neoclassical motifs. On the right hand, you'll basically see a Robert Adams-esque uh, design with rinceau, which are intertwining vines, but it's also conflated with something new, which is the kind of uh, fountain-esque motif. We'll see that over and over, and it had a special significance in the 1920s. So things are beginning to synthesize here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we have the Fred French building. You should just take it away. Oh, uh, yeah, this is Sumerian revival, believe it or not. Uh, it's the Fred French headquarters. He was a major developer in the 1920s. He built Tudor City. 
And it wasn't unseemly for a capitalist uh, merchant or prince of commerce to build a monument to himself. Here he's likening himself to King Nebuchadnezzar II, mm -hmm. uh, much like Frank Woolworth with his Cathedral of Commerce and uh, other, other major mer uh, capitalists also built themselves temples. Walter Chrysler, of course, mm -hmm. built one of the strangest buildings we've ever seen mm -hmm. and had an 11th century bedroom somewhere up in there. He lived in a old English style bedroom right in the middle of there. And I read this, I don't know if it's true, but he also had the highest toilet in New York <laughs> up in the crowd. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, I actually have a new spiel about this and it's a new thought. So I just wanted to introduce it. Uh, let's see. Art historians classify things by taxonomies, categories that share things in common. Taxonomies can be monothetic, a single category with everything in common, say late Minoan art, or they can be polythetic, that is many categories sharing some but not all characteristics. Art Deco is extremely polythetic with an incredible variety of categories, sharing only a few characteristics in common. And as we said in the opener, it's drawn from everything from French Moderne from the 1925 exhibition, which was really a modernistic machine age overlay of neoclassical motifs. And there's also flavors of Viennese secessionism, German Expressionism. If you think of the lightning bolts next, uh, next to the entrance of the Chrysler building, that's straight out of Metropolis by Fritz Lang. And we'll see it ranges as far as Egyptian and Babylonian revival. Which you would say this is Babylonian revival. Yes, and, and at times a combination of everything together, yeah. which is probably why the style flew under the radar nameless and undetected for so many decades. Do you want to talk about some of the colors here and all the different motifs? We have the sun in this vermilion rays and we have the griffins and the uh, beehives with bees and it's a pretty fantastic. This is on the top of the Fred French building. It's about 50 stories above uh, Fifth Avenue. And I never noticed it before until I did this book. I've walked by it hundreds of times and I've been in the lobbies men, in the lobby many times. And when I saw that, it, it took my breath away. Yeah, this is just an incredible amalgam of just about everything. We have this Sumerian imagery, but at the bottom you'll see a Vitruvian wave in blue. And that's just about the oldest motif that we know of from 350 BC. And it's framed by a rosette, uh, a border of rosettes, which is uh, very Renaissance. And then you see flanking beehives, which are a traditional symbol of thrift and savings. But this is based on the great mosque in Jerusalem. So it's, it's really a melange, Sumerian, uh, Arabic, with uh, classical pilasters, with Corinthian capitals. It's absolutely fantastic. And the polychromy, that is the use of color, is just dazzling. Some more details of the lobby. We see the eagle on the mailbox and a close up of the chandelier uh, with all sorts of mo uh, floral motifs you see here. There are sort of feathers here and above there, and then back to the Sumerian sort of revival here. And of course, the winged horses. Yeah, and below that uh, arched uh, curve there, we have Sumerian hunters on horseback, bow and arrow, hunting with their hounds under palm trees. So it's 
really fantastic. Especially for New York. Especially for the middle yeah. of New York. <laughs> This is the fabulous Gray Bar building, which was built as part of uh, Terminal City, which was built around the time of uh, Grand Central Station. So the buildings are sort of thematic and they all connect to tunnels to Grand Central Station. Um, and because it housed many maritime and transportation businesses, it reflects that in the outside architecture. So you have these very strange heads that are holding these um, I forgot what you call these guy, 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 lines. guy lines to a ship. Um, and here we see Poseidon holding a fish. This is in the limestone carving on the side of the building. And of course, the most famous feature are the rats going up the ship lines and that they're being stopped here by this baffle. But there are many other rats that have made it aboard the ship already. <laughs> so. Again, something I never noticed until I did that book. I had obviously seen these. There's three of them. And I think there was another entry which was taken down sometime in the past. OK, here's another really nutty image. Uh, this was done by Thomas W. Lamb, who was a theater architect by trade. And it was the sort of club headquarters for the Knights of Pythias, who were a benevolent society, much like the Shriners. There was really nothing mystic going on there, but they wanted the cachet of, let's say, that the Masons had. So they went for the arcane, and Lamb certainly delivered. Here we have an Egyptian vulture who's associated with the goddess of the upper Nile. We have uh, polychromatic papyrus motifs, we have uh, twin cobras. So they went all out and it's not really coherent, but it's really marvelous. Another detail. And this is uh, another traditional Egyptian symbol, the disc, the winged disc with the twin serpents. It stands for divinity and the disembodied soul of all things. Uh, with a frieze of papyrus in a nice ultramarine blue. Okay, this was Eli Jacques Kahn, one of our most decorative architects from the 20s. Uh, he sort of ran an international house of interior architects. This was done by a Dutch architect named Bart van der Verde. The interior, this is the, the interior line, we're talking we're about. Here. Yeah, sorry, uh, this is uh, a mosaic on the wall. And van der Verde was fresh out of the Netherlands and had been much influenced by what was there, a new edition of Frank Lloyd Wright. So he was doing Wrightian design and Wright's career went through many phases. We think of him always as this great architect, but, and, but his career went into penumbra a number of times and he always bounced back. So this is a reintroduction of Wrightian design to the United States. It's really going full circle. Okay, this is 7 Gracie Square, which is a small apartment building near the river on 84th Street, actually. And this is, again, done by Edgar Brandt, um, who we saw earlier, who did the metal work on 34th Street. Um, the, uh, the doors below it have elephants, and then this was the relief on top of these um, gazelles are made out of a very strange alloy of cadmium zinc and nickel, which I don't believe is used anywhere else in the city. Um, and the building at, in the 70s, it was covered in aluminum siding because they had terrible leaks. And now it's actually been landmarked and protected and restored, which is nice. And Brandt, of course, was uh, a, a great Art Deco master, but was coming from the French neoclassical tradition and les biches, as these uh, animals are called, were a popular motif because they looked good when 
pictured flatly, which is a lot of a common motif in Art Deco, that it's flat. And this was considered modern and new as opposed to 19th century sculpture, which was in the round. Art Deco was all about speed and surface and movement. And we'll see that over and over also. So here we have one of the most amazing buildings in New York, which happens to be diagonally across the street from the Chrysler building, which we'll see later. This is a frieze done by René Chambolin, who did it go, wraps around the entire building uh, on 42nd Street down to Lexington, down to 41st Street. And I think Eric would love to tell you about the evolution that is shown here. Yeah, this is one of my favorite axes to grind, but this frieze depicts evolution. Uh, in other panels, you'll see single cell organisms and they evolve to the glory of flight as represented by geese who symbolize aviation and the skyscraper itself, which reaches up to the skies. You need to put this in historical context. Uh, it was pretty bold putting evolution on a major office building because the Scopes trial had been as recent as 1925 when it was illegal to teach evolution in a public school. So keep that in mind and think of that, this as a blow for science. And also Lindbergh had just crossed the Atlantic in 1927 and was the most famous man in the world, the most celebrated human being on the planet. So flight was in everybody's mind. You see some more panels here, and this is going back to the, uh, going back to fish and we see sea eels and there's an octopus leg in there um, and uh, undersea ferns. And then over here, this is a lobby grill, um, which is showing very stylized floral motifs. And then above the frieze, we see these very strange dragons that are biting each other's tails. And then these floral things again. Yeah, just briefly, uh, Chambolin is not a, well, he's not a much recognized figure but he's all over the city and he had a sly sense of humor. He did a lot of gargoyles. He did the gargoyles on the American Radiator Building. Mm -hmm. And if you know what's called the English Channel at Rockefeller Center that leads down to the Prometheus by Paul Manship, he did these wonderful little fountain figures. Uh, they're nereids, which are female sea gods. And the drains are just charming. They're turtles and crabs. Uh, he got the idea from David Rockefeller Jr. who took him up to the family estate and showed him his own fountains. So uh, Chamberlain is kind of a humorist too. He did the El Dorado as we'll see. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so here's a couple of uh, little details from the Bronx. Um, on the left, we see some terracotta reliefs from Parchester Apartments, which was, of course, built by Metropolitan Life after they did Stuyvesant Town. It's a little bit different because they used a little bit more ornamentation. The landscaping is a little bit better. And each building has a little thematic scene of nature. There's an, a commercial area where there is a movie theater. That's where we see this large um, panel with the woman surrounded by doves or pigeons, you could say. Uh, on, the right, on the right side, we see the Grand Concourse. Uh, this is a Jacob Felstein building, and this is a detail of a bird. And the mosaic work is just spectacular. This is just, this was built for middle-class housing, really nothing more, and it, it was, the decoration was just incredible. And the fact that it's in perfect condition to this day is also incredible. Oh, just one thing, the image on the left gets back to the question of when did deco really end? We know mm -hmm. approximately when it started, but we're not sure when it ended. And mm -hmm. Andrew would argue that it hasn't. Mm -hmm. 
This is more WPA style, which is very sort of social realist. It's mm -hmm. a working class mother. Uh, and the image, if you'll notice, is she's feeding the doves with grain. And sewing and feeding were very popular WPA images. It was actually a symbol of big government providing food for the starving masses and decent housing and basically everything we should. <laughs> Okay, this is, uh, I like to call it the Protestant synagogue. It's on Fifth Avenue. It's a statement uh, by the uptown Jews that we've arrived. We're no longer in the ghetto. We belong in New York society like the Catholics at St. Patrick's. Uh, it's extraordinary. It's not typical synagogue architecture, even though there is really no standard for synagogue architecture, interestingly. They usually use Moorish style, but that goes back to Europe. Uh, here we have kind of an Episcopal style with round arched windows and a big rose window in limestone, very impressive. And here we have symbols of the tribes of Israel uh, at the top left is Judah the lion, the leader of Israel, and the bottom is the serpent, uh, symbol of the tribe of Don, the protector of Israel. Ah, the, oh, the Chrysler building. Okay, <laughs> what, what else could I say? What can we say? Yeah, so <laughs> the Chrysler building, when you think of it, you don't think of it as having a lot of floral or bird motifs, but when you start looking at it, there are some, and you see the elevator caps, which of course are made with 17 types of wood, including ebony and the papyrus leaf design on them. I mean, they're just incredible. And then the top, you could say, the crown, you could actually say, well, maybe these are crowns of a bird feathers. And of course it has the eagles. So there are a lot of motifs with birds and nature. And, of course. and this, I think, is one of our most synthetic images. This is actually the radiator cap of a 1929 Chrysler. It's a stylized version of Mercury's helmet, his winged helmet. But here we have the machine and the organic in one fused image. And Mercury was a common image. You'll see it all over Midtown on Grand Central Station. He stands for uh, commerce, speed, uh, all the things the 20s was about. So, this is St. Bartholomew's Church by Bertrand Goodhue. And when you see the outside, you would not really consider it Art Deco. It's almost more Moorish, would you say? Moorish revival. It's actually, oh God, I'm just blanking on Byzantine. Byzantine, yes. But when you walk inside, we see Hildreth Mayer's beautiful, beautiful mosaics. So when you come in the entry, there are three narixes, which are the domes inside the entry. And they are just covered with these mosaics of all sorts of fish from the sea. Um, you can see the continuation of them here. And then this is over the altar. You see this, uh, well, it could be a pigeon. Oh, it's the, it's the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, it's okay. a traditional Sorry. symbol. And uh, just as, well, this is another blow for science and evolution in a religious context, interesting. Uh, Hildreth Mayer was one of our great mosaicists. And interestingly, she was doing Temple Emmanuel and St. Bart's at the same time. And she had to remind herself, left Jewish, right Episcopal, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> when she was going to work. And these are some more details uh, around the altar. Uh, we see the more pigeons, of course, and then we see a unicorn. And then this is the... Um, uh, what is this called? Lectern. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. The lectern like at the scene. altar 
Yes, very much like this, except this one's a little bit nicer. And um, <laughs> it's got the eagle. And, and this was done by Lee Lowry, who we'll see later, who did quite a lot of work at Rockefeller Center. So it was like a whole group of these artisans that worked for, they were like the go-to people, I would say, in the Art Deco. So it was Lee Lowry, um, Salon, um, of course, Hildreth Mayer. She did everything. Okay, so this is a uh, this is one of the uh, one of the skyscrapers, the Art Deco skyscrapers downtown. At one point, I believe it was the tallest concrete stone building in the world at 700 feet. Uh, it's the Citibank Farmers Trust Company, which became Citibank, of course, and now it's apartments. Um, this is Cross and Cross, the architects, and David Evans did the sculptures, and it's just. The, the exterior is just filled with owls and squirrels and it, it's, it's almost comical. Um, and now this building is, um, it's a walk up because the elevators don't work. So it's a 57 story oh walk up building, but it's a beautiful building though, as you can see. Yep. Okay, so this is our cover baby. <laughs> um, and this is the Cranlin Apartments, and you get the, it's a mixture of Cranberry Street and Brooklyn together. So if we see this, and um, this is just, I mean, look at that tail. I mean, look at the peacock tail. Just look at that. Um, and then we see um, sort of floral things here. And then I would argue that these are floral, but they're sort of, mixed with a machine age kind of thing. These things on the right, they're like flowers, but they're mixed with gears as well. And the color, I mean, don't forget, this is all terracotta. And this was, I mean, the colors, you don't see this very often. And here's a fun building. This is an apartment building on the Upper East Side called the Milan House. And Andrew Thomas was not known for being an Art Deco architect at all. Um, the building goes from 67th to 68th Street and it is just a, a panoply of, of owls and bats and squirrels and possums, pretty much any animal you can think of and bulldogs too. I guess that's an animal right here, uh, yes. It's, it's, it's a great building and it's a mirror image of itself on uh, 68th Street. It's really worth going to look at. Okay, so here we have on the left, this is a detail of the El Dorado, which of course is the famous twin towered uh, Art Deco apartment building on Central Park West. And this is uh, Rene Chambelan again, did this relief again of a pigeon here. And then this is a sort of um, non not nondescript, but it's an unknown building. It's at 580 Nostrand Avenue, which is in Crown Heights. And it's sort of under the elevated train. And you have this incredible terracotta, these floral motifs and the sort of chevrons and pigeon. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, I, the building is in disrepair. And I think it's sort of forgotten and nobody cares enough about it to keep it preserved, which is sad because there's multiply that by a thousand buildings in New York every day that sort of disappear. And just as a note, you'll see the stylistic similarity between the El Dorado and the Chainin building, mm -hmm. both done by yeah. Chambalan. Right, the very flat relief. So here, we, I just want to say that the Empire State Building, again, when I started to look at it under the auspices of this book, when you look at the crown, these are wings. There's actually wings supporting the mast. And of course, the mast at one point without the TV antenna was meant to dock dirigibles. And of course, that didn't work out. They tried it once and the whole thing started to rip out. Um, so they dropped that idea. Um, and then the entryway is very, you have these eagles, these very serious eagles, which are sort of Viennese secessionist, I guess you would say, similar to the uh, Hearst building. And the Hearst building, if you don't know, it's on 57th and 8th, and it has a similar base, I guess, because they were planning to put a high rise. The Empire State Building also has a four story base, and, but they did make the high rise. For the Hearst building, which has almost identical eagles, they put the high rise in, in the 1990s, so. Oh, and, and just parenthetically, the Empire State Building is part of this delirious fantasy of transportation that they had going on in the 
1920s. Mm -hmm. Imagine docking a Zeppelin to a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. right and here. that yeah. went all the way through to the 1960s when they had helicopters landing on top of the old Pan Am right. building. Yeah. A very bad idea as mm -hmm. it turned out mm -hmm. because one crashed and mm -hmm. killed the pedestrian in the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was all part of this seamless fantasy of motion. Yeah, multiple levels with all sorts of vehicles flying everywhere, you know, plane taxis, helicopter taxis everywhere. So this is a building, this is done by Marvin Ginsburg and Marvin Fine. Uh, and this is off of the Grand Concourse. So we think of a lot of Art Deco buildings on the Grand Concourse. This is actually in the shadows of Yankee Stadium. And this is called the Park Plaza Apartments. And we have these crazy terracotta birds and in different, in different profiles atop here. And there's a million motifs here. We have uh, sort of magenta and green peacocks. We have the we have the frozen fountain again. And then of course we have this motif, which is the rising sun over the city. Uh, just briefly to get back to the frozen fountain, it's a stylized representation of the setback skyscraper. It rises and rises, but it also stands for just the sense of prosperity and flowing wealth in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. The money was there and it was always going to be there was the point of view back then. It was free flowing, never ending. This is an interesting place. This is also in the South Bronx. This is called Herman Ritter Junior High School, a school for Al Pacino. Uh, and it's a square building, except the tower is canted 45 degrees as it meets the corner, which is quite unusual. And you have these figures that again are sort of Viennese secessionists of the figures holding open books, which you see on the side up here, there they are. There's quite, I guess there's 16 of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and here's another synthetic design. The maidens look like Louise Brooks straight out of a silent film with that haircut. Mm -hmm. But the crown is a Babylonian ziggurat rising in successive inlaid uh, circles, uh, just like a ziggurat. So uh, it's two things going on at once. Mm -hmm. This is Waldorf Astoria, which was <clears throat> under construction, uh, under renovation as they're turning it into a condominium. And this has a very spectacular eagle, kind of a mean eagle. Um, <laughs> as you were saying before, there's happy eagles in some Art Deco and there's very mean eagles. And I'd say he's kind of a mean eagle. Um, and we see these decorative floral motifs here. And these are really interesting. These are very stylized, um, very, what would you call this? That sort of a cocoa bean here. Um, yeah, it's interesting, the geometrization of nature. They, they yeah. turn nature into a machine or yeah. it's a yeah. synthesis. Mm -hmm. Uh, here we have the city services building, which later became Citgo, and it was also the AIG insurance building. Um, this is another skyscraper downtown with all the setbacks. It's a typical Art Deco skyscraper, and it's it's spectacular um, and has these beautiful aluminum panels. Um, who designed these? I forgot. Who did these? Oh, Cliff Parkhurst did that. And we don't see him anywhere else in the book, but you see these incredible, again, the sort of frozen fountain or the petals of an opening flower. And you see that's a, an aster. But then above you have these butterflies drinking the nectar from the flower. So you see them on either side here. And that this is actually a detail of these here. Yeah, so many things going on. The zigzags, Deco was in its day called zigzag modern at one point, and the rays of the rising sun, uh, the frozen fountain. Uh, so that goes back to that polythetic quality of our Deco. So many sources sharing a few things in common. This is the, our only entry from Staten Island. This is the Ambassador Apartment Buildings. 
rumor has it that Humphrey Bogart lived there at some time. I can't believe he lived in Staten Island, but it's possible. <laughs> um, and this is Lucien Pischiato, the architect, and he specialized in luxury apartment buildings. And the, again, the colors here, the orange, the blue, the gold, the white, the indigo. Um, and this could be a copy of Edgar Brandt or Chambolan. I mean, those are definitely their motifs and they're not credited to do this building, but it's still pretty fantastic. This is a very important building. Now we see Ralph Walker again. Ralph Walker, one of his main gigs was working for telecommunication companies. We saw his New York telephone building earlier. So this is the AT, AT and T Long Lines building. Don't forget the, the phone companies were all separate in those days. So AT and T did long distance calls, and we see these sort of um, depictions of all the continents of the sort of um, not as developed people, I guess it's sort of implying, getting the technology. They're holding out their hands, you see, very lucidly and loosely. And these golden rays are the communication. These are the wires that are coming from the, the great American company. Um, this again is Hildreth Mayer, um, the great, uh, great mosaic artist. Yeah, she really did gold very well. Yeah. You see that in a lot of her work. Yeah. And this interpretation of the cultures may seem a little backward by today's standards, mm -hmm. but it was really part of the culture back then that we were the light to the nations. Mm -hmm. uh, we have China reclining on his throne, leaning on an elephant and lazy Egypt, of course, in front of the pyramids, reclining on the lioness. But they were tired after building, they were the, tired. After if, building the pyramids. If, they were if, tired. If, if you look at the customs house, you see the same kind of depiction by Daniel Chester French. We have Africa sleeping on her throne mm -hmm. and China enthroned on a throne of skulls. It's, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. So it's, pure Teddy Roosevelt imperialism, but it's, it's kind of beautiful in its own wicked way. Okay, here we have another Ralph Walker building, which was, this was recently landmarked. This is the Salvation Army headquarters on 14th Street. Um, and it's, we see the, uh, this is cast stone and we see it looks like curtains. The entry is like a curtain and the eagle, of course, it represents determination, fortitude, all the things that eagles represent. And inside the portico here, which is quite unusual, which is covered by this gate, which has these floral uh, themes on it. There's a poem and it says, weep as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison in and out, in and out, as they do now, I'll fight. While there is a drunkard left, where there is a poor lost girl upon the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight, I'll fight to the very end. And that's William Booth. And I think that's, it, it, it's written here. It's quite beautiful. And of course, I can only think of guys and dolls. When I right. Think of the Salvation yeah. Army. Right. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the neoclassical? Oh, yeah. Yes. Here we have a pretty pure derivation of Robert Adams uh, in a deco mold, but we have the rinceau, which are the intertwining vines, the two colors rather than polychromy. We have uh, black and a kind of pumpkin and a Renaissance arched, uh, a Renaissance arch, which is Adamesque and uh, chased with a Rinceau there, the, the vines. So this is very typical in Broadway theaters. If you just look around at intermission, you'll see tons of Adamesque design. Uh, there was uh, one architect with the unfortunate name of Herbert Krapp, who did a lot of Art Deco theaters in an Adamesque style in, uh, in Broadway. In Broadway. Speed it up. 
a little bit. Okay, so here we have one of the most spectacular buildings in my mind. This is right on the Grand Concourse. This is the exterior mosaic of 1150 Grand Concourse, also known as the Fish Building. This was also done by Horace Ginsburg. We saw their work earlier in the Park Plaza. And again, this sort of relates to evolution. We have these sort of simple little creatures here that are evolving into fish. Uh, and the colors are beautiful. And one thing that always amazes me, I've taken tours inside of this building. It's 90 years old. I don't believe it's been renovated or restored and it's still in perfect condition and it's never been defaced in any way, never graffiti. And I think it's a testament to how beautiful it is. I, I think when I, I took a tour group inside the lobby and some woman sort of yelled at me saying, oh, you're not allowed to be in here. And a young 18 year old like took me by the arm and he said, oh, this is great. I'm so glad that you're here. And he lived here and he lived in the building. He knew he was so proud of it. And he's like, he can look around as long as he wants. And it's, it's just great. And so again, we see some details of the mosaic here. And this is the lobby, uh, which is a little bit more sort of uh, art more dern or streamlined it's not so art deco but but they were parallel style so yeah and the fish literally has all colors of the rainbow yeah it's just mm -hmm. extraordinary yeah okay. and here we have paul manship the sculptor who did prometheus of course and these are the bronx zoo gates again i've never seen these before i did the book and this is worth a trip it's just it's about 100 feet wide and about 30 feet tall and it's just uh, Chock a block with all sorts of animal sculptures, including turtles and yeah, Manship. Uh, we don't really know his name now, but he was the most celebrated, highest paid Art Deco sculptor in his day. He did Prometheus, I'm sure you all know that, but his specialty was animal sculpture and what I would call furnaces. Mm -hmm. He's uh, intertwining vines. You'll see it at the Children's Gate in the Central Park Zoo and at the Bronx Zoo, of course. Mm -hmm. No, you talk about this. Oh, uh, this is pretty pure neoclassicism to my mind. Uh, the diamonds look a lot like the Pantheon. We have some white metal. We have stylized flat, of course, representations of the Four Seasons and uh, there are a lot of other kind of uh, neo uh designs, rosettes, and so forth. But then you have this very Art Deco uh, hanging fixture, pendant like. And also, yeah. OK, there's a lot to talk about. This is Rockefeller Center. OK, I hope we don't uh, run over time, but this is the the friendship between France and America at Rockefeller Center, it's directly lifted from Lorenzo Ghiberti's Gates of Paradise for Il Duomo. You put them side by side and you're amazed. It's just a lift, a lift off, but uh, these very beautiful intertwining birds and flowing hair. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is on the Sixth Avenue side. Uh, this is Robert Garrison. These are the end uh, panels of morning, present, evening, and it shows the, the figures on, on eagles and uh, swans flying through the air. Yeah, most images at Rockefeller Center represent the power of radio, which was RCA's stock in trade. These are figures of radio working 24 hours around the clock reading the morning and kind of tired at night. Okay, and here's some uh, more details. And this is Lee Lowry sculpted these. We saw his work in St. Bart's and uh, Leon Salon actually was the colorist. And this panel is the, again, it's the history of mankind. And you see, it's very strange. It covers pretty much everything. So you have, modern industry here with the smokestacks and then you have a mosque here and then you have a medieval castle here a sailing ship and then you have ancient greeks and there you have mercury so it's got everything if you like anything you'll find something you like there <laughs> 
and this is a detail, this eagle is a detail of that lower left-hand panel. And above are, uh, th this is not related to this, this is the, the English, um, the English building that's in Rockefeller Center. Yeah, and these that's are the, the coat of arms right. of Great Britain, yep. the three lions, actually. Yep. Okay. Uh, public, uh, Brooklyn Public Library, very interesting building. This is uh, sort of carved into the stone, very, very uh, shallow reliefs, and then painted or gold leafed right in place. Um, this front screen, the entry screen, uh, we see these are all related to books, different books. There's, of course, Moby Dick, Babe the Blue Ox. Um, yeah. And the yeah. two pillars, one is knowledge and the other is the arts. Uh, the lion is on the knowledge pylon. And yes, we have another lion of Judah with an ancient Greek below him. Scholar an ancient Greek scholar. And this serpent is associated with the goddess of Athena, who uh, has the power of death over Greece's enemies. Uh, and that's Babe the Blue Ox. Two different sculpture, sculptures. Yeah. Um, and we included some of these uh, details from the subway, even though they were done sort of a little bit before Deco, but after Deco. And Squire Vickers was the sort of architect overseer. He was a very talented guy. He was into, he was a great painter and he picked all the color motifs and hired all the artisans to do these terracotta panels. Um, we see the cornucopia with the fruits and the flowers. And this eagle is actually still in 33rd street. You can still see this. This was at the gray bar building. This was the subway entry sign. There was two of these and they removed it. It's now in the transit museum in their uh, vaults, basically. This is all uh, bronze. It's quite impressive. It's about three feet tall. And it says, it's a big sign that says subway. And then there's another seahorse on the other side. And once again, this is one of these mellow eagles as opposed mm -hmm. to the warlike eagles. Yeah. I think the mellow ones might go back to Ben Franklin who actually wanted the turkey to be our national bird. Mm -hmm. But we got the eagle from the Iroquois Five Nations uh, and it got very fierce in the 30s and certainly in the 40s. Okay, finally, we have to say, did Art Deco ever die? I argue that it didn't because these are two modern buildings that have just gone up. This is uh, 111 West 57th Street. This is uh, the Steinway Tower built over the old Steinway uh, showroom. And you can see there are these bronze details here that are very reminiscent of Deco and also the setbacks here. And then this is sort of a mid-range condo on a side street, but obviously referencing Deco. So Deco is still alive. Yeah, the Steinway uses 26 different types of terracotta, which is extraordinary. And it's also extraordinary because you can't really see it without right. binoculars because yeah. it's set back from the street. I saw them installing them when they were pulling them up from the street and I thought, who's ever going <laughs> to see that? They're so detailed. It's amazing. <laughs> and they're on the outside too. So it's not even as if the people who live there are going to see it. Okay. Oh, this is the last uh, Two Park Avenue. I used to work in this building for years and I think it's on the ceiling and I would just marvel at seeing something new every day. This is by Eli, Eli Jacques Kahn and was part of his international house. The interior architect was from Bombay and said he was very much influenced by Indian architecture. And to my eye, it kind of looks like Indian textiles, the colors you would see in their textiles. And it's also a very machine-like overlay of a neoclassical grid. So polythetic again. And that's it. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat>
presentation. I think we all will look at the city with all these, with new eyes. But enough of my comment, because I would like to take some questions from the audience. Do we have any questions? Yes, thank you. That was that was wonderful, and we'll say more later. I grew up in Inwood, the most northern mm -hmm. tip of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Is Inwood in the book? Unfortunately, I shot a I shot a lot of buildings in Inwood, but unfortunately, just okay. didn't make it in. It's yeah, okay. there's a lot of cast uh, deco details yeah. there. Um, that and there's some oh, there's some beautiful terrazzo floors, but they either didn't fit into the theme of the book mm -hmm. or they weren't splendid enough. I guess um, right. There's nothing in Inwood. I don't think no. No, we were, we were looking specifically for organic motifs. There's tons of deco of other sorts all over the city and keep your eye out for it. Oh, you know, actually the book does have art deco from Inwood. I, I forgot, just not in the slideshow. There okay. is, uh, there's a building on West 187th Street that has a beautiful entryway and that's right. in the book. So okay. I think it is. That's more Washington Heights, but I'm yes, just gonna say right. about Inwood. I'm still enchanted, even though you didn't include it. It was a very yeah. wonderful childhood. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a great um, I, don't I also think your mic encourage... is live. Oh, hello. Yeah. Yeah, yes. It is. I want to also encourage our online audience to submit questions. And um, I've got... but in the meantime, sir, I'll come back to you, but I'm going to take this gentleman at the back. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a quick question about the suppliers of all this beautiful uh, terracotta. Uh, I had read somewhere that there was a firm, I think, uh, on the north shore of Staten Island that was operating yeah. in this period. Were there numerous per, uh, manufacturers or was it dominated by a single firm or a, a handful of firms? Yeah, I, there were definitely numerous terracotta firms. Can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, you can, there definitely were a lot of terracotta firms. And if you go to the South shore of Staten Island, there's a beach where the old terracotta factory used to be. And if you go along the sand in low tide, you can see a bunch of terracotta pieces that are left there. So a lot of um, mudlarkers like to go there. But th that particular company and its name escapes me, they had um, offices and manufacturing facilities all throughout New Jersey and Staten Island and Brooklyn as well. I recommend a book called Terracotta Skyline by uh, Susan Tunick, who's uh, the head of Friends of Terracotta and she knows everything. So. <laughs> right, if I could uh, ask you a couple of questions from the online audience. Um, Oh, is the New York Yacht Club in your book? No, I wouldn't I, say that's No, that's, uh, that's Warren Wetmore. Yeah, and it's actually and right across, across the street. The street yeah. And that's really mannerist. It's a very strange building, but it's pre-deco. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that building, but yeah, it's, it's before great. our time. I wish we could put it in <laughs> yeah. somehow. Okay, another online question. What percentage of the art deco included uh, birds, et cetera, and the motifs you were looking for? If that's clear, what percentage of art deco included birds and the motifs you were looking for? You mean just birds out of what we covered or? Oh, in well, how much? Oh, okay. Well, Third. how many how many pigeons were there? How's that? A lot of pigeons, <laughs> so many pigeons. I couldn't believe it. Well, he's the pigeon man. If yeah. You look at well, his, his but son. I guess the question is how many buildings featured nature, natural motifs? Okay, and if that's the question, I'm guessing about if actually, if you look closely, there's always something. I, I think you can't avoid it. Um, so I would say half of the buildings have it. It definitely happens. Yeah. And often you see it in combination like that city service building, mm -hmm. which had the owl, has incredible That's, uh, captains of commerce at the top. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty nutty. It's uh, architects always claim they're doing just functional things and that these were uh, sort of radiator vents, but they're sentinels of capitalism. It's uh, yeah. unbelievable. 
since the term came so late, could they pin down the guy or gal who came up with it? Yeah, there was one guy and his name was Beavis Hillier. He was a British art historian and he coined the term in 1968 in a little tiny book called Art Deco. And he was the first guy to say, hey, this is an era in art history. And he actually omitted the United States in the book. He talked about French and German Art Deco, but nothing about the Chrysler building or the Daily News building. And he remedied that in a catalog resume in 1970. And he said, what was I thinking? You know, but he blazed the trail and now it's everybody's favorite art form of the 20th century. Uh, Beavis is B-E-V-I-S and Hillier is Hill, I-E-R, and it's called Art Deco. A great book. Uh, he does mention Mesoamerican influences like the uh, Chichen Itza and the stepped back pyramids. But like I said, uh, you can't find New York in that book. Um, thank you, that was really wonderful. Are you going to be doing any more tours of these places? Um, we might do a tour with the Municipal Art Society, but we haven't set that in stone yet. Okay. And the weather's going to get to me. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we will just take a few more questions, but this is an online question from Bonnie. How was Art Deco impacted by the crash of 1929? A lot. I mean, every building, basically. Uh, you know, they, yeah, basically every building. When the Empire State Building went up, they called it the empty state building for many, many years that took to fill it up. And in some cases, it took 10 years to fill them up. Uh, till 1952 oh, for the you. Empire State. Yeah, so that's uh, 22 years for it to fill up. So many of these buildings were built at the height of the crash and some of them were stalled because of funding ran out and some of them stood empty or basically empty for many, many years. And basically a whole new style came in in the 1930s, which is called depression modern or streamline modern. And you'll, once you recognize it, you'll see it all over Manhattan, primarily in apartment buildings. It's actually a very inventive style because they had zero budgets, but they were still trying to do something creative. I actually like the style very much. Right. right. Um, after this, there'll be one more question. I've been wondering, did the architects do the decoration? Uh, in many times, they hired people, and we tried to attribute as many as we could. They had a stable of people that they used frequently. Um, Hildreth Mayer was one of those people. She did the mosaics pretty much all around the city. Um, I, I recommend that you go to One Wall Street, which is just opened as a new condominium, but they have the red room that she did that it's not really, uh, it's, it's just it's more abstract, but it's quite spectacular. It has like 50 foot ceilings and it's all these colored mosaics that go from red to orange and the whole ceiling is gold. It's spectacular. That's actually a very interesting subject and would be worth a book, I think, about how the partnerships mm. operated. Uh, Hildreth Mayer worked with Ralph Walker often, and also with the great church architect, Bertram Grosvenor Goodhue, as did Lee Lowry. So they kind of worked in teams, and many interior architects are associated with exterior architects. Right, we'll take our final question if we have, okay. So my question relates to what we've just been discussing here about the artisans from the different crafts, woodworking, stone, carving, metal workers, et cetera. How were you able to identify either the individuals or the firms? Where did you do your research? What resources did you go to to find that information? Google. <laughs> uh, 
there's quite a lot of books on the subject. And of course, there's just a ton of information, but you do have to be careful because we were just having this discussion about limestone and cast stone. And in the uh, Salvation Army building, you see that sort of crenellated curtain wall entry that Ralph Walker did. And I've read in some places it was limestone and then other places it was cast stone. It's quite a difference. So it's difficult to really find out what the truth is unless you go there and look at it yourself. I think it's cast stone, personally. Yeah, yeah me too, because limestone was chiseled by hand that has sharp edges. Right. Whereas cast stone is really a concrete, mm -hmm. poured it's concrete, as I understand. Right. So it's blurrier at the edges. Mm -hmm. It right. comes out of a mold rather than- Right, and of course, yeah. limestone is way more expensive. Um, and we saw in the New York Telephone Building, all of those, the elephants and the birds, that was all done with cast molds that were repeated. You know, he did the, they were done by machines. You know, they, uh, one person, one artisan carved them. And I think we mentioned his name before, but then they were copied and made into molds and they just poured the cement, basically it's cement or cast stone is cement, a similar variation on it. And they just reproduce them. So there's, if you go look at that building, it's just, you know, there's acres of, of uh, decoration. And uh, that was uh, the beauty part of terracotta, as we say in New York, was that you could mass produce it, whereas something like Rockefeller Center was made by hand. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, they were making a statement with that, that yeah. they could afford carving. Yeah, they had the money, right. They the, had the, the money. <laughs> uh, Ulysses Ritchie, if we didn't mention that, and John DeSeracy uh, did the carvings at the New York Telephone Building. And from that, they made molds, so. Anyone else? Um, we'll, I tell you what, we'll let the audience ask their questions to you in okay. person while okay. you're signing your book. Okay. How's that? And before, you completely, well thought, before you completely run to the back okay. of the room, we just want to express again our huge appreciation, time. really. Yes. Well, we have to say thanks to you both for sharing your expertise, your infinite knowledge, your wonderful photographs, which I believe from what you said earlier, you, you photographed them for over the last two years, would that be correct? Yeah. And it's just, we are just so delighted and thrilled that we should be one of the places that you are um, sharing your book. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And I'll just quickly add to Karen's comments because I always, as I always say, she steals every noun and adjective. And um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Many of us, I'm sure after this lecture, will be entering more lobbies and, and yet another reminder of how richly blessed we are to be in New York City, truly the greatest city in the world through thick and thin. And as I was sitting here, I was thinking about, you know, 2020 in the past couple of years and how buildings, these great works of craftsmanship, artisanship, uh, tradesmen, metal workers have served as a source of, of comfort and stability. And they're objects of art, they're functional and we're blessed to have them and uh, we should appreciate them. And I, and I have to say, I really do. And thank you for giving me more to look at. And I confess, that I didn't go in the West Street building. It's never appealed to me. And I have to, go, I, I can't wait to go there. Yes, I mean, <laughs> it's beautiful. Ways in. I know, I'll make my months. way in there. It took about two months to get access. <laughs> All yeah. right, thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you. And to our audience, thank, thank you for you. coming thank out you. tonight. Thank you. Of course, to mention that you are New York Art Deco will be signed now by, by Andrew and Eric. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes.